pray. <laughs> Anyways, dear God, I pray that everybody that's here uh, had a good week. I pray that you bless everyone that can give and bless anybody that can't give the people that can't more money. Lord, I pray that uh, everybody has their ears open to the message tonight and that everybody has a good week there.
says is valuable and worthy, it really shakes us down when we look at someone that the world says is worthless. That's the struggle. Jesus said the greatest commandment is love. Love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. And so us Christians really get messed up with that one. Because we look at someone that's not very lovable and we'll say, well, they're not really worth anything, right? Or it's such a sacrifice to love them. Look how holy I am. I'm loving this loser. Or I'm, oh, I'm giving them a meal. Or I'm, you know, I'm hugging them and they stink. And it's because we have assigned their value based on the world. Jesus looks at them completely different. For sure. I like to think of this place is a place that sees value, only it's just a little rough around the edges. Thank God God saw something in me, as rough as I am, and went, I can blow off the dust, I can put some pressure on this thing, and try to turn it into a jewel. I'm still in the pressure cooker, aren't we all? Yes, ma'am. We know, though, that our tribulations and our trials is the thing that joy comes from. It truly is the pressures. We know that tribulations produce what? Perseverance. Perseverance, endurance, endurance, hope, right? And so we look at something that's worthless. God knows the value in it before you ever get there. Thank God he sees the value in it, right? If only we could see the value in it, right? All right. So now let me ask you this. Does everybody have an equal value? An equal worth? Yes. God, yes, yes, absolutely. But he's called some to this and some to that. He says some will have a what, 30-fold faith, 60, 100-fold, right? So he gives different gifts to different people. So are we, do we all have the same value, the same worth? Yeah. Yeah. But we don't act word. like it. No, now, come no. on, you know the answers, but you're not passing the test. <laughs> all right. So often we fall into the trap. We wake up in the morning and we only see value in those things that serve us. So I like this one phrase that I came across. If your presence can't add value to my life, your absence will make no difference. That is a Facebook post if I ever saw it. Right? In other words, if you can't help me, I don't need you. Okay, that is really, really screwed up. On the surface, that looks like, well, yeah, you don't need people that pull you down. Right? No, you don't. You don't need people that are going to get you addicted, right? You don't need people that are going to drag you away from the Lord. True. But if the value in someone is only for what they can do for you, yikes, then the Lord would have toasted us a long time ago. That's right. Thank goodness he saw value in us, when we did him no good. And most of us, we still aren't doing him no good. He's just a merciful God, right? And he puts up with us. So... What makes us worthy of God's attention? What makes us worthy then? Like, if we can so easily look at something and go, that is of no value to me. That is of no value to me. From, you pick up some, let's say you pick up some rock out of the garden. Literally, rock. No value. It could be your pet rock. Franco. Right? You could put the googly eyes on it. Like, how many of you had a pet rock in a shoebox? You're yes. really showing your age. Yes. All of us that are... Chess, did you really? I did. Okay. Too. All right. So it's still a gender. Javi, did you have a pet rock? You did. Yeah. Pet rocks are cool, right? So we give that rock value. It doesn't Yeah, it doesn't need change. But all the other rocks in the garden are of no value, like Franco. They're not as precious as Franco, right? What if actually that rock broke open and inside was like quartz crystals or some kind of gem? Now that has value. But when it was a rock, it was worthless, right? And so I know that God sees the inside of us, and he knows our value. When on the outside, we look like as dumb as a rock, right? As dirty as a rock, right? All right. So let's look at value a little bit. In Luke 7, it's the story about Jesus. He was walking about, and he was doing so many miracles. People were so drawn. It says... When he concluded all his sayings and the of the people, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So picture this centurion, an officer, and he had an employee that he loved, 
okay? If you're a boss at work or you're you're the employee and you have someone under you, think about that person that you just you just love them dearly, okay? When he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one who he should do this was, uh, was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. In other words, these guys went ahead for the centurion. He's like, go get Jesus because this man is sick and I, and I don't want him to die. And so these men were so happy to do this for their boss. Anybody have a boss they like to work for? I've got an awesome boss. I love to work for her. I love her dearly, right? So I'll do anything she asks me to do. And so these guys were running ahead to Jesus for their boss. They're like, if there was ever a good man, this is a good man. And he's coming to you, not for himself, but for his servant. Would you come to his home for his servant? Okay, so that's where we're at. Now, that's even with a good man, right? And so Jesus is willing. So Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. The centurion who had authority, who had people under him, recognized Jesus as who he was and said, I'm not worthy, even though he was a good man, right? Many of us finally come to the realization, I'm a good man. I haven't murdered anyone. Right? Hmm. You know, first time we hear about the Lord and our pride is there, we're like, I'm not going to hell. I'm a good person. I'm better than so and so. Okay, but you're not as good as Jesus. So you can just throw that out. And so this man, knowing his place, in a place of authority, knowing his authority comes from God, is saying, even if he's a good man, saying, I'm not even worthy for Jesus to come to my home. He knew his order, right? And he didn't even want Jesus to come all the way to the house. He says, therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. He not only knew who Jesus was, what he was capable of, but he realized that he was who he said he was and that he was not worthy. And yet he knew God would do for him what God said he would do. And that's us. It's like, when you get into the place of humility, and you're like, God, I can't do it. Only you can. And you're willing to do it for me, but I'm not even worthy. You're right, you're not. But God loves you anyway, and he's willing to do that. He didn't even feel worthy for Jesus to come into his home. And he wasn't even asking for anything for him. He was trying to save his servant's life, but he didn't feel worthy. When we get to a place where we don't even become in awe of God and feel like it's a privilege to worship or a privilege to even enter into prayer and talk to the creator of the universe. We start to become arrogant in that as if God owes us something. God doesn't owe us anything. Jesus died. He gave it all. Like he's already done paid up. He owes us nothing. We are of no value to him. He needs nothing from us, but he gives us value. Right? He gives us our word. So that's what that centurion said. But just say the word and I shall and he shall be healed. And then he says, For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does this. That is the first step in understanding God's love, is that. God is all authority. And when you put yourself in position under him and you honor authority, that, and all authority comes from God, then that which is under you is subject to you. And God places you in authority. And so this man's saying, I understand how authority works. And he recognized Jesus had authority over sickness. Jesus had authority over demons. He had authority over depression. He had authority over cancer. He had authority over heart disease. He had authority over poverty, right? He had authority over all this. This centurion recognized he has authority. And a man in authority, when he speaks, those that are under him listen and have to serve. And he realized demons have to serve him because he understood, understood authority. In a humble way that he came under Jesus' authority, saying, even though I'm in authority, you are my authority. And because things 
that you have authority over must obey, then all you have to say, Jesus, is demons go, sickness go, and it has to go. You don't have to be at my house for that, right? So many of us get caught up in the hocus pocus of how God works that we think everything has to be perfect for God to do the healing. No, it doesn't. All those things are subject to Christ. They're subject to him. He's the man with the power for the hour. And it's in his name, even the spoken word. The power's in the spoken word. And the centurion understood that. And Jesus was so relieved to finally come across a man like this. So this is what he says. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. Because the centurion understands the spiritual law of authority. If Jesus speaks, the demons must listen. The sickness must listen. And all that come in his name have that authority. And so he didn't even feel worthy to let Jesus walk in his home. But he knew, because of who he was, that he just had to speak it. He knew that he was in the right order, coming to Christ to ask, because he was asking for his servant, and he submitted himself, and he believed that it would be done. He didn't have to see it. He didn't have to watch Jesus lay his hands, right? He understood authority. That's why I have always implored people who have such a rebellious heart against authority. You are a dangerous territory, because you then are rejecting the authority of Christ. And you are in desperate need, like I am, of that authority, authority working on your behalf. Sure. You need the Lord to have your back. Amen. Because all things must bow down to him, right? Greater is he who's in me than he's in the world. Mm -hmm. I need that dominion over the enemy. My power over Satan on this earth comes because I have been submitted to Christ. He is authority over me. But those things have, a, have to be in, subject to authority of mine. Of my walking, my faith. We have a, we have what's called dominion. That means things that are under our feet, we can just like that. Because I've subjected myself. Now when you step outside that order of authority of God and you're like, I don't, you ain't my boss, right? You can't tell me what to do. You have just stepped outside of the order of authority. And I wasn't even going there. But this centurion recognized that. That's how we can have amazing faith when we have fear. That we're not sure God's got us. That we truly don't understand authority. Those things that are subject to Christ must obey him. Alright. So, let me ask you this. Let's look at Matthew 10. So Jesus is walking in this authority. <coughs> that he had to be tested and tried the same way we are. Remember? He turned 30. He becomes public. He gets baptized like we're doing tonight. He was led into a 40-day time of testing to get his flesh under the authority of the Father. He had to become subjected to the Father. He didn't make things up as he went. He only listened to his Father. And he did that perfectly. And so he had this authority. And so in Matthew 10, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Have you ever been given authority by someone in authority and you got to speak on their behalf? You know? I would, when the kids were younger, I'd send them with a note to the store that they can walk to in my neighborhood. Go there and tell, this is what you need. Here's five dollars. Show them the note. They'll give you the thing and the change. So the store clerk knew they were acting on my authority. Right? They knew who I am. So they're like, oh, okay, Jonathan, you need you know, half gallon of milk and blah, blah, blah. He went in my authority, right? So Jesus gave this authority he had to the disciples. What made them worthy? This is the authority of Jesus Christ, of, of the Lord, the Son of God. And he gave this authority to these guys, these, you know, crazy fishermen, a tax collector, a doctor, a loud mouth, and two brothers who just want to fight, right? They were no better than us. They were no better than us. They had no clue what was coming, right? They were about to enter a reality show like no other. <laughs> For sure. 
but he gave them authority. What made them worthy of that? Same thing that makes us worthy. God created us for a purpose. Had nothing to do with us. We can't take credit for it. He created us. He knitted us together. He put worthiness in us. Right? So later on in Matthew 10, he says, as he's telling them what they're going to do with this authority and how they're going to be persecuted and how when you decide to stand up for Christ and walk in his authority, people are not going to like you. They're going to hate what's in you. Right? Because if Jesus has all authority over demons and things, those things are not going to like you. Right? So down in verse 28, he says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. In other words, the things that we think are worthless, like a little sparrow, one little bird, one little bird of the billions of birds, and that what's, what's that worth? And yet Jesus has his eye on that sparrow, right? And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You know why we're worthy? Because he made us worthy. We are worth something to God. We're his children, if we choose to be. We are worth something. Even if you've been told you're worthless. But Jesus said, you're worth the authority I give you. You can walk about and represent Christ. As if Dad gave you the note and sent you to the store. Right? And if you had an account with the store, you could go there and they would charge the account on the authority he carried. Right? It's really cool to be able to go and get things and swipe someone else's credit card, but it has my name on it. I have authority to buy things. Cool. Which will really come in handy when I go to Colorado. Because it's going to get me a taxi cab from the airport to the hotel, right? And I just swipe that baby. And then when I get back with all my receipts, I just sign my name. I have authority. But that authority's been given to me by my boss. That authority's been given to her by the Lord. And I have to honor that when I delegate to those that are under me, right? But my word is as good as my boss's word, right? And so when my employees come and they have to buy something and I sign off that says I have the authority to say that right so Jesus says be careful when you're going about in my name people are going to want to kill you but he says don't be afraid because if he sends you out and you're that valuable he's going to protect you he's got you he's got this so what makes you worthy of God's love what makes us worthy when we do the most <coughs> cruddy things we have the most evil thoughts in our head we do the same things over and over and over again. And yet, God says we're worthy. Jesus makes us worthy. Now, I, have no, I can't tell you the good without the bad. Okay? So you ready for the other side? The rest sure. of the story? We can call Harvey lovers. <laughs> Further down, and after the next verse, is this. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. That's a warning. Because remember, he warned us. People are going to hate you. Remember what Peter did when they were going, Oh, you're with that Jesus guy. And as he's watching Jesus being arrested and tortured, he's like, I don't even know him. Right? Well, that is, is going to come to you. Your faith is going to be challenged. Your Christian walk, your identity... Oh, you belong to that church. Oh, you go to that church. Oh, you're a Jesus freak. Oh, are you a Christian? Do you wear a cross necklace? I suppose you believe all that Christian stuff and that religious stuff, you know? And that is going to hit you. And then you have to decide at that moment, do I reveal, do I stand strong in the authority that I walk in, even if people hate Jesus? Because if they hate Jesus and you walk in his authority, they will hate you. Yep. Welcome to the club. Right? <laughs> Jesus says we have this, you know, instead of the He-Man Woman Haters Club from the Little Rascals, it's the He-Man Jesus Haters Club. They're out there. It's called persecution. It's called pastors being killed in countries because they have home churches. It's true. Right? 
It's called torture them, cut them in half, sell them in half, because they're a Christian. For no other reason but that they're a Christian, right? And the day's coming in this country, right? That is, whoo, it's coming, all right? So be careful that you don't fall into that temptation. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now that doesn't mean you hate your parents. Jesus is very clear that you're to honor your parents. He's saying, if let's say you had pressure. I don't want you going to that church. Well, forget church. You don't need church. I don't want you doing that Christian thing, loving Jesus, um, that Christian stuff. You are going to do this, right? And you have to choose, right? All right. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Again, if that pulls you away from Christ. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. In other words, you're worthy. If you surrender and say, I am your child. Being God's child makes you worthy. Your child is worthy of your love and your protection and your sacrifice just because they're your child, right? I mean, just being your child makes them worthy. They don't have to do it right. No matter how many times they stab you in the back, they're worthy. Same is true with us and our Heavenly Father. If you're His child, that's a choice. That's a choice. When we accept your Heavenly Father's love, we realize Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. That he would set, allow his son to die on a cross to pay for all your ugly, all your hatred, all your lust, all your murder, all your lying, all your cheating, everything. He paid for that so you could be his child. As soon as you say, oh, thank you for that. I can't do this. I'm not good enough. I'm a sinner, right? And as soon as you accept that sacrifice, now you're worthy. You are no better than you were yesterday. But today as his child, you're worthy. And then he begins to do a work in you, right? We call that salvation. We call that being born again. And you start over. Now you're a child of God. And now he's going to speak to you and show you what loving is all about, right? What forgiveness is all about, healing, right? And so Romans 5, I want to talk about how amazing God's love is before we get ready for baptism. Romans 5 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Right? Maybe that centurion. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still sinners, or I'm sorry, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ had made us friends of God. So we are enemies of God until we realize what he did for us. What are you willing to do for someone who's doing horrible things? Many of us have our limits. We all have our limits, right? We have our limits. You know, I challenge my students as they get ready to go out into the world. You're going to have your limits. What happens when the patient you have wheeled in is escorted by police officers because he's actually from the prison and he got injured and you find out what his crime was. You going to treat him right? No. As a counselor, we had to challenge and spend many hours, semesters, looking at our limits. What's your limit? Who can't you counsel? Who would trigger something? For an example, someone who was maybe abandoned at birth may not do well with clients whose problem is abandonment. It might be so emotional for them that they can't be any good to you. So you have to know your limits. I mean, that's a real thing. Even the most mature Christian has their limits, right? 
What's your limit? Who would you not die for? And yet Jesus, seeing all that, still died for us. Even those people that would push your buttons, that you would be like, I'm sorry, I can't do that one. Thank goodness we weren't that person. When he, when he saw all of us and he's on that cross and he's like, oh, this is awful. This sin is horrible. Oh, I can't do that one. That's I cannot die for that because that is so evil. But the stuff going on that's evil is evil. Right? Evil stuff that we see. And yet Jesus loved that enough to see past. He didn't love the evil. He loved the person enough to die for that. If they would surrender to Christ, they too are forgiven. Right? So we can't say we're better than the other person. Because we're all scum buckets. Without Christ. <laughs> but with him, we're worthy and we're precious. Alright. So, because of that, Matthew 3.11. John the Baptist was saying, as he's getting people ready to have Jesus come on the scene. He says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who's greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not even worthy to be his slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. To say that you're not even worthy to work for somebody, to remove his sandals and wash his feet. John knew his position. He knew authority. He was a great prophet, yet he wasn't even worthy to change Jesus' sandals, wash his feet, serve him, cook him a meal, he's saying. And they were cousins. I mean, they were blood cousins. And he didn't feel worthy to be in the, in the presence of his own cousin because of that, because of the love that Jesus was pouring out. And as sinners, we're not worthy of God's love. We're not worthy of his forgiveness. We have done nothing to earn his forgiveness. We can't do enough good to pay back the evil. You cannot do enough good to erase the bad. Sorry. How many people spend their whole lives thinking they can re redeem themselves? They are inspired by guilt all their lives. Some of the great philanthropists, these great people that do give millions of dollars away, inside they're actually trying to work off some moral debt if you got right down to it. If they really got down to thinking that would do it, right? You know, I'm a good person. I donate to public television. And I volunteer at the Humane Society. Okay, what does that have to do with your evil heart, right? So there's not enough good. We're not worthy. As good people, we're not worthy. Mother Teresa, not worthy. Good person, Billy Graham, not worthy. Still a sinner. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Fall short, fall short, fall short. We didn't fall short once. It wasn't all have sinned and fallen short. That's not what it says. It says, for all have sinned and fall short, we fall short no matter what. Thank God he loves us, makes us worthy. But through the blood of Christ on the cross, that blood covers us, and when Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see us scum buckets, us worms he sees. His son Jesus. <laughs> He sees Jesus. And that's the oxymoron. My daughter asked, what's an oxymoron? It's the two things that cannot coexist that are smashed together. We are washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Blood doesn't wash things clean, does it? You can't even wash it out of the carpet. They can find it with their fancy chemicals, right? Can't hide crime scene. But try it. <laughs> Wash it in the blood. It goes against all intuition to wash something with blood. But Jesus washed us with blood so we would be whiter than snow. Okay? And we are forgiven, yet we are sinners. We are worthy, yet we are oh, so condemned. Right? We are worthy. He makes us worthy. Right? All right. So we're going to step into baptism. Anybody is welcome. And I know that we have some excitement and some celebrations um, for some new uh, salvation. And then we have some rededication and some new chapters. If either one of those is you, I invite you to go ahead and get baptized tonight. Okay? There's nothing special in Bowling Green water in that little plastic reservoir there. <laughs> But the blood of Jesus 
washes us. And baptism is what? It's a symbol of dying with Christ, becoming up raised, resurrected, washed clean of our sinful nature. And publicly, remember when he says, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before my father. It wipes that out because he's, there's, you're saying, I'm publicly doing this. What's in your heart, we can't see. Only God knows. But when you lower yourself in the waters of baptism and come up, you're saying that publicly. Now, you can do that and still not be saved. I mean, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were coming down, running down the beach and jumping in the water and getting baptized. And they were rebuked and corrected and said, now, wait a minute. Be careful. Because just because you're getting in the water don't make you a Christian. No more than what? Parking in the garage makes you a car. <laughs> <laughs> Water baptism doesn't get you to heaven. It's a step of obedience, knowing that all authority is God's. We're stepping in the authority of God. We're receiving the forgiveness, being made worthy in our unworthiness, and we're doing it publicly. All right? Does that make sense? Okay. So as we go ahead and prepare, if anybody needs to go change their clothes or do whatever they were going to do, okay, we'll take time for that. And then what we'll do is we will mosey over here. And since we're not a huge group, I think we can probably go ahead and kind of reset ourselves. Let's move to the back, and we'll close out service back here, okay?